So Max, what does ambition mean to you then? I was thinking about that a little bit this morning. To me, ambition makes me think about reaching for something. And also it makes me think about scale and something to do with moving towards a greater scale. And it's quite abstract. There are also lots of pictures in my head, probably planted from stories about ambitious individuals. Do you think ambition should be or could be anything other than individual? Can it be collective as well? Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I was keen to, to talk to you about that. A few years ago, I was in a discussion and a friend of mine in the UK, Barnaby Rain, talked about reclaiming ambition as a collective ideal. And I remember thinking that that really resonated. So the short answer is yes, I think ambition should be thought about in collective terms. Maybe one thing to say is I'm kind of interested in the ways that ambition is oriented individualistically. So I'm interested in the way in which we're encouraged to think about ambition in individual terms when we talk about getting on the housing ladder in New Zealand, when people talk about career paths and pipelines. And one thing I'm interested in is whether in the last 30 to 40 years, there's been greater use of that individualized ambition narrative. And I suppose what excites me, even though definitely I've found myself thinking in those terms in the past, is thinking about reclaiming ambition as a collective ideal. Different kinds of collectives and groups working in teams to achieve things and where that's been done in the past. And I guess one agent for that kind of ambition is government. And it makes me think about free public services, universal basic services as one way of achieving those kinds of broader collective goals. So when you think about this word ambition, do you think of yourself as ambitious? I think in the past, I've been driven to try to achieve certain things. And I actually feel like I have a different kind of drive now than I might have had when I was younger. And that's for like a lot of reasons. So yeah, I would like to think I'm kind of ambitious for doing things with other people, but I probably now mostly see ambition as the word that's tinged with negative things. I probably shirk from wanting to be ambitious or to see myself as ambitious. Are you comfortable sharing any of the reasons why that changed for you? At school, probably like some people had some motivation to achieve academically that I didn't really understand the origins of. It was like something that I just kind of stuck my head into and put my head down and worked hard. I'd also had lots of advantages through family and teachers and other things. And I think that in part led to people encouraging me to do certain things and planting in my head certain ideas about what I could study and where I could study and what I could be. And as a side note, I think it's also interesting to think about how gender and ethnicity and class and other factors all play into how ambition is inculcated in people. I think I was sort of nudged and encouraged and directed in this way. And yeah, definitely planted in me some goals about what I wanted to study and to do and to achieve. And I studied law and I worked as a judge's clerk after law school, working for a judge, which I think in some circles in law school is seen as a role that is prized for some people. And then I went and did overseas study. And I'm saying all of this because I think one reason that I've shifted in my thinking on this is just that I found that realizing these goals that I had taken on didn't necessarily bring me the deep satisfaction that I got from doing other things. So that's one thing. Realizing personal ambition wasn't deeply fulfilling in itself. And then secondly, relatedly, I think reflecting more on where the ambition and motivation came from. Yeah, it made me doubt my own drivers and made me think that some of maybe what was driving some of those steps wasn't parts of myself that like I wanted to cultivate. And then at the same time, more positively, I guess, I was involved with other things, other collective projects that really did make me happy and made me feel like I was contributing and made me really proud. One example was this group Just Speak, which I kind of stumbled into working with when I was judges clerking for the Chief Justice, Sean Elias. And that was a great job. It was fulfilling intellectually and it was something I learned a lot from. 
in the evenings with some friends that I had met in Wellington, we set up this criminal justice advocacy group. And yeah, it wasn't something, you know, I had thought about in advance or planned for. Yeah, it was a group of 10 to 15 poor people. And we did things like organize a camp for young people in particular who came from around the country. And we had meetings and monthly forums. And yeah, I just found myself really stirred by that and fulfilled by that. And that felt different to me from some of the kind of individual goals and individual sense of achievement that I've been encouraged to think about and that I probably myself had thought quite a lot about. That's interesting because usually at this point I ask people who is the most ambitious person they know and ask them to describe the most ambitious person they know. But given that you've been framing your discussion in collective terms, I wonder if you would like to describe an example of collective ambition that mm. impresses you or that you admire or that has struck you in some way. Last year, I helped out on a campaign that had been running for a while in the UK called No More Exclusions, which was about fighting school exclusions and really admiring of how this small group of people, in particular during lockdown, in the UK fought with young people as well who had been excluded. I do think public services for all of their occasional failings and faults are a really beautiful and aspirational example of what people can do together. Yeah, one example is the National Health Service in the UK and the public health care system that we have in New Zealand. In both places, these public services are full of holes and are probably underfunded and have historically not served the whole community that they're meant to serve, excluded migrants and had other problems. But these are mostly or in part free public services. And I benefited personally from the NHS because I had some major heart surgery in 2014, which was also unexpected, what's called aortic root replacement surgery, which is quite intensive surgery and has a not insignificant mortality risk. And I had this incredible surgeon who said, don't worry, we're going into the surgery together and we're going to get through it. And I had nurses who were really incredible. I stayed in intensive care for two nights, which was longer than planned, especially on the first night where I had some bumps after the surgery. I had this amazing nurse who just talked to me through quite a bumpy night. My mum is also a nurse. And I suppose this experience for me despite lots of hidden costs like GP fees in New Zealand, the fact that we can go to hospitals for free and go down a corridor and have people, as a friend said recently, from like very different backgrounds and class and ethnicity and gender and all receiving, yeah, high quality service, I think is a really beautiful thing. And that has come from a vision of something being so important that it shouldn't be just left to the market and that it should be provided for collectively that has been delivered on and been maintained over generations by expert professionals like doctors and nurses and also people working in the public sector and managers and administrative workers and cleaners and support staff. It's really interesting to hear you tell that story of your experience. We'd been in the States for just over a year when my son, who was a year old, had interception, which was not necessarily life-enhancing. The surgeon sat there and said, this may or may not result in us giving you your child back. The individuals involved were all incredible people, mm. but it was very much service coming from a bunch of individuals rather than a collective. That felt very different to what you're describing, you know. A year after we got our son back, they sent us a bill for his anesthesia because the person who anesthetized him for the emergency surgery was out of our billing network mm. <laughs> it was like you couldn't do life-saving surgery on an infant without anesthesia but this whole experience that you're describing where to put an American turn of phrase on it everyone's rooting for you and to help you out there just wasn't that sense there were all the individual components but it didn't have that collective sense of we're all here for you and it felt like something was missing and so to mm. hear you describe that similar sort of experience with the parts all working together notwithstanding some of those other issues you've mentioned is a really powerful powerful thing to hear so my last question is whether there is anything that would enable you to be more ambitious i sort of want to reframe the question if i can what are the conditions that we can create to enable ambition to be reclaimed as a collective ideal to work together on 
collective projects that we can be proud of. We sort of need to mend how we interact with each other. A lot of interactions and relationships in society are quite broken for lots of deep reasons, including the way our economy is structured, the dominant ideas that we have about race and gender and class flow from that. The loneliness that we have in society, which is connected to a lot of those things. I guess another more concrete point is if government is one agent of collective ambition or one delivery point, to use like quite a cold term for collective ambition, then also I think we need to rethink how we view government and how we view paying tax, which I think is an important resource for delivering on that collective ambition. So we need to see government as capable of doing beautiful and brilliant things. And in New Zealand, I think that has its special challenges because the government has been involved in perpetrated colonization in the past. So I think many Māori like reasonably see the government as lacking in legitimacy to take one challenge there. But I also think government isn't necessarily the only agent for this kind of collective ambition. And it's about creating the conditions so that we can build up those collective projects again. And maybe one thing to add is I do think this also maybe more negatively involves trying to undo some of the dominant individual ways of thinking. There's been a dominant idea of the Kiwi dream as individual home ownership. And I can understand that in some sense in that I definitely understand the desire for security and stability that comes from having a home. But I think, and I've written a little bit about this, that it's a bit sad that the sort of ultimate dream that's been posited by people who talk about the Kiwi dream is this individual one. And so I think there's a task here to rebuild some collective dreams and to encourage thinking and acting that sees action in teams and in groups and working together. Seems like it's come partly around a circle. If you think back to the generation grandparents of mine that came back from the war, it feels like we're approaching the point of making the kinds of decisions that society made when they returned in response to, in that case, a sort of an external shock. But here there's just this series of collective shocks. We're just running up to the point where our individual solutions are clearly not working in the same way that people just said, look, we need to do something different here. I think we're coming up on that realisation, particularly if you look at the housing story. There is no answer to that. There's no way that leads to an outcome that any of us want collectively. You know, we don't want to end up with people living in cars and trailer parks. We are at the point where people who own houses don't want the prices of their houses to fall, but also there's this growing recognition from wider society that there's something bigger here that is more important than that. It's an uncomfortable transition to move from we're all responsible for ourselves to actually we're all responsible for each other. Yeah, exactly. Someone who I worked for in the UK, John McDonnell, after the pandemic actually talked about how looking back now, at least in the UK, he was thinking, but I think this also applies to New Zealand, can think of a kind of like post-war social and political order from say the 1940s to the 1970s, 30 to 40 years of a certain kind of settlement, which wasn't perfect in lots of ways and shouldn't be romanticized, but did involve some collective projects and public services. And then he talked about 1980s to now, which is another 30 to 40 year period where, as you say, you know, there's been the kind of rise of values that focus on personal responsibility, people being left to fend for themselves. And it doesn't necessarily mean just reaching back for what came before. And yeah, sometimes when there's talk of new public services, universal public services and public ownership, one knee-jerk reaction is to say, oh, that's going back to the 1970s. And that was top down, that excluded a lot of people. But at the same time, there are like lots of stories I've heard from talking to people that did live in that period. And Kim Workman, who was involved with Just Speak, for example, often talked about creative partnerships in the public service earlier on in New Zealand's history between Robson and Hannon, for example, on criminal justice issues. And so he, he actually called the trust that was connected to the work that he was doing, the Robson Hannon Trust, in recognition of that creative collective work that was done and yeah other people talk about you know bb and the education service and times here where we've had this really kind of innovative aspirational public service thinking um, so i think there's a lot we can learn from that even if 
the challenges that we have to deal with do require some thinking grounded in the present. I think there's quite a lot of talk at the moment about young people having all the answers, <laughs> say on climate change. And I think there's like huge energy and impatience and vision from like lots of young people. But to me, like, yeah, a lot, a lot of the exciting and like effective projects I've been involved with have been kind of intergenerational partnerships. Mm -hmm. and like with Just Beat, which had kind of Kim Workman, who was older, and then a bunch of us who were younger. And as you say, people filling gaps in each other's knowledge and experience. Stuff gets forgotten, I think, is the efficient way of saying it. Mm. You know, we design things for what we know. And then someone who's been through it before can say, well, the reason that it evolved this way is because of this particular thing that is not at the forefront of your mind because you haven't seen it. But when we did it last time, this is why we did it this particular way. And so those voices of experience are hugely valuable totally. because people know things that they've gained through experience that someone looking at something and going, oh, I know how to fix this. <laughs> Theory and experience are both different skills to bring to the table. You know, having worked in the UK public sector as well as in New Zealand, there's this tendency for the bright stars to be encouraged to move on after two years and point themselves at anything and everything rather than invest in depth. Mm, totally. And there's a huge value in that and mm. in having smart people look at something with fresh eyes, but there's also huge value in lived experience, engagement, relationships knowing where and what has been tried before, why it did and didn't work, and that some of those cultural factors within public sectors erode that as well. And I'm not sure anyone has an answer to that. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why I kind of ended up consulting so I could specialise mm -hmm. and go deep and stuff, because I watched people who I was very impressed by kind of go into these roles. I was like, how can you speak in public to the media on such a broad range of stuff how can you how can you feel confident across all of that subject matter because I only ever felt confident across subject matter if I knew it intimately and mm. there were obviously people with skill sets where they could kind of consolidate bits of it and still present publicly but I never felt confident doing that unless I really understood something deeply so for me putting myself in a situation where I could continue to focus on a small number of issues and do that over a lengthy period for a long time that just kind of got me past that particular thing that was becoming a roadblock for me just found myself wanting depth rather than speed I guess getting to the place of like integrity where you know what you can speak on and you know the limits of what you can speak on and and you know something really yeah deep that's deep. a really yeah. good word for it actually the ability to actually wing it versus truly be grounded in your knowledge and to know <laughs> no exactly but yeah and I think one other thought on that is like yeah I think in law dunking yourself into something quickly and becoming a quick expert is really valued as well it just as it is I think in consulting yeah. some kinds of management consulting maybe I think Joe Williams has talked about this in law like how you know he's a judge and he talks about how in some kind of Maori communities there is this idea that you're all already part of the community and that's a bit ridiculous to think you can kind of entirely stand back from that and so that the key is sort of like acknowledging where you have stakes and acknowledging where you might be connected in different ways and not trying to cut all of yourself off but being aware of that one of the things that um, my frequent collaborator peter wilson is often saying is that in new zealand there are always going to be conflicts because it's so small you know, you have to manage conflicts by basically being honest, by disclosing, by recusing yourself from doing things simultaneously. And mm. you're a woven part of the fabric. You can't snip mm. yourself out thread by thread. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. You know, it's that's, just not realistic. Yeah, I think that's the same thought. Eh? It's like, and just realize how you're already embedded and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and be open about that. And it wraps back to your point about the sort of lionizing of individual, mm -hmm. you know, it's individualism and independence and all of that. The visual image I had that started me on the path to this project was just mm -hmm. this image of ambition in New Zealand being Richie McCaw and the ghost of Sir Ed Hillary on a <laughs> snowy mountaintop with their arms around each other going, you know, <laughs> that's how I saw ambition. I was like, this is not right. I mean, I just see 
people doing amazing stuff in communities and families mm. collectively outside of sport and business. And I really want mm. to celebrate and elevate those other expressions of drive yeah. and authenticity. Choosing the word ambition was almost like a little bit of a elbow nud because it does make people uncomfortable because it is mm. problematic in a lot of ways. It's just really useful just to see the diversity of things that people point their energy towards, really.